Hello. In this era of consummate fixation with relationships, I'm delighted to talk with you for a few minutes about one of our country's most ironic relationships, one that's always been less than satisfactory, yet has lasted for more than two centuries. It's the relationship between the US Supreme Court and the journalists who convey its doings to the nation. These two essential institutions, both firmly grounded in the Constitution, are the subject of my new book, The Supreme Court and the Press, The Indispensable Conflict. As you may know, the Supreme Court got little attention from our founding fathers. Yes, they created it in the Constitution, but barely defined its role in the new government. It wasn't important, it seemed. As a result, the leading lawyers of the day weren't interested in serving on the new court, not even as Chief Justice. Part of the problem was that it was only a part-time job. All the justices were expected to ride circuit, which meant traveling around the country to sit as trial judges. It was so burdensome that even those few lawyers who accepted the job often used it as a stepping stone to what they considered higher office. President Washington didn't think much of that judicial responsibility either. When he finally got John Jay to become the first Chief Justice, he soon sent him off on an important diplomatic mission to Europe, a mission that resulted in the Jay Treaty of 1795. After that, Jay resigned to become governor of New York, definitely a better job. Washington then turned to his loyal and very talented former aide, a formidable power as Secretary of the Treasury in the new government, and that, of course, was Alexander Hamilton. But Hamilton declined. A couple of rejections later, Washington finally got Senator Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut to don the robes. But then once more, the president sent his chief justice abroad on a diplomatic mission. It too was successful, and after only four years as chief justice, Ellsworth quit. So what did that slow start have to do with the press, the small newspapers of the day, and their coverage, which was only occasional, uh, of the highest court? Well, not surprisingly, since the court didn't amount to much, just meeting infrequently to deal with routine commercial disputes, the papers didn't pay much attention to it. Whether it was chicken or the egg, who knows? But in those early days, the court didn't pay much attention to the press either. Then and to this day, the justices announced their decisions from the bench, sometimes reading all or part of their opinions, sometimes just paraphrasing them. That's the official action that signals the court's ruling. In fact, it is the court's ruling. Of course, those rulings aren't, are accompanied by a written opinion explaining the court's reasoning. Now, not surprisingly, that written opinion is very important to a reporter who's writing about a decision. And if reporters don't write about the court, who will even know about it, much less understand it? But that didn't occur to the court. At least it didn't make a difference. For it was common practice for the justices to announce a decision without having completed the writing of their opinion, or without having a written opinion available for the few reporters who were there to read it. So some of their early stories merely stated that the court had decided such and such a pending case, with no effort to explain the basis for the court's decision, its legal reasoning. To make matters worse, the reporters, thus kept in the dark, the reporters sometimes got the decision wrong, perhaps inadequately comprehending some Latin or other legal language that a justice had used in announcing it. Days later, or even weeks later, when the court finally got around to making its written opinion available, some papers would print it in its entirety, huge globs of black type, uninterpreted, unedited, while other papers would ignore it, figuring the case was no longer news. Confronted with those two extremes, the general public sometimes never did find out exactly what the court did. When Chief Justice Ellsworth resigned, John Adams was president, and the vacancy occurred near the end of his term. He had been defeated for re-election by Thomas Jefferson, so he was on his way out. So was his cabinet, including his highly respected Secretary of State, a distinguished Virginia lawyer named, you guessed it, John Marshall. As they both faced unemployment, Adams approached Marshall. Would he accept appointment as Chief Justice of the United States? Despite the court's low profile and prestige, clearly indicated to all by the fact that it was then housed in a small and very plain hearing room on the ground floor of the new Capitol building, Marshall inexplicably took the job. America and American history changed forever. Just two years after assuming his office, as we all know, the court announced in Marbury versus Madison that it had a powerful authority not even mentioned in the Constitution, 
the authority to declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. Curiously, nobody disputed it. That was 1803. For the next three decades, the Marshall Court churned out an endless flow of important decisions. In particular, the court applied three clauses of the Constitution, the Contracts Clause, the Necessary and Proper Clause, and the Commerce Clause, to turn commercial disputes into the strong cornerstones of the new nation. This sometimes necessitated a curtailment of state powers. Could Maryland tax the new National Bank, for instance? No, Marshall famously wrote in McCulloch versus Maryland, the power to tax involves the power to destroy. That was in 1819, and that really got the attention of the papers. They wrote about it for days. Now it was very clear. Marshall and his court were important and powerful, and they were newsworthy. As they endowed the federal government with authority so great that it alarmed the Jeffersonians, the press and the nation wanted to know about it. Interestingly, the Marshall Court never ruled on the legitimacy of slavery, and cautiously it declined to extend the Bill of Rights, those protections enacted to limit the powers of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the citizens. It declined to extend them to restrict state governments as well. Nevertheless, in the face of its rising profile and importance, the Supreme Court remained indifferent to the press, you might say, to the public. The court still failed in many cases to have its written opinion available ready on decision day. In all, that failing persisted for a century or more. Sadly, that myopic view of newspapers' significance was accurately reflected in the court's shameful attitude toward freedom of the press. Though that freedom was guaranteed by the First Amendment in 1791, part of the Bill of Rights, for a century and a half, the court did not enforce it. In fact, even in cases of blatant suppression of the press, the court hardly noticed it. Fast forward to the 20th century. In 1907, a Colorado publisher ran articles in his newspaper alleging that the state's Supreme Court was illegitimate that it was part of an unlawful scheme to seat several Republican candidates in place of Democrats who had actually been elected, including the governor and two justices of the Supreme Court itself. The accusations were audacious, maybe brazen is a better word, but this publisher was no fly-by-night pamphleteer. His name was Thomas Patterson. He had served as a United States Senator from Colorado. He was a lawyer, and he argued his own case before the Supreme Court. No matter. The court made short shrift of his argument. The court's opinion dismissing the publisher's appeal was written by none other than Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. Holmes then was staunchly conservative, not at all the Holmes who later gained prominence as a defender of free speech, eloquently dissenting while the court was still squelching it through the 1920s. A few years after dismissing Patterson's appeal, the court did much the same in a case involving an Ohio editor. He too had dared criticize state judges and was adjudged in contempt of court. Same result, no freedom of the press there either. Conviction affirmed. When the court at last discovered the First Amendment in the middle of the 20th century, it still was in no mood to make things easier for the reporters covering the court, who by then were no, numerous. It seemed obvious to the reporters at the court, and I was once among them, that without us, the American public wouldn't know anything about what the court was up to but the court continued to see things quite differently. For instance, it refused to make its written opinions available to the reporters before the decisions were announced from the bench. That kind consideration, on a confidential basis, of course, would have helped the reporters immeasurably, particularly those reporting for the wire services, who needed to produce instantaneous stories the moment each decision was announced. I was in that very competitive group, for in those days we Wall Street Journal reporters wrote for the Dow Jones News Service as well. At some point, the court began secretly recording its oral arguments. Those arguments are the formal but spirited jousting between lawyers and justices, the justices testing the arguments being presented, sometimes showing flashes of humanity, skepticism, disbelief, even humor. Oral arguments make lively stories. They also help the public to understand the legal issues, which are rarely simple or straightforward. These arguments in those days were frequently covered by reporters for the New York Times, the Associated Press, and other wire services, the Washington Post, and the Washington Evening Star. It would have helped them greatly if they could have listened to the recordings after each oral argument to help clarify the issues and to get the quotations absolutely right. But the reporters didn't even know the tapes existed. 
That too was a secret. For years, no word leaked out. When a CBS reporter, Fred Graham, finally uncovered the secret, he saw it as an opportunity to persuade the justices that making the tapes available would benefit the court and the public's understanding of its work. He presented his scoop that way. Was the court persuaded? Well, no. Chief Justice Warren Burger, in fact, hit the roof. He was furious that his secret was out. He was so mad that he ceased sending the tapes to the National Archives and ordered them locked up at the court instead. In recent years, the court has relented somewhat. It now makes transcripts of the oral arguments available to the press and the public at the end of each daily session of the court. And at the end of each week, audio recordings of at least some cases, perhaps mostly all of them now, are similarly made available. The daily transcripts are helpful to the reporters to convey the sense of the oral argument and the exact quotations of the justices and the lawyers. But the audio tapes, which would be enormously helpful to broadcasters and internet news sites and to the public, come too late. And most significantly today, the court still refuses, after more than a half century of requests, proposals, and bills in Congress, it still refuses to allow television in the courtroom. Now that courtroom, despite the elegant grandeur of the court's exterior, the courtroom is too small to accommodate many spectators. They wait in long lines outside, hoping to squeeze in. The attendance is so restricted, only about 200 seats available for the public, that the court allows some visitors in for just five minutes. Yes, five minutes. And even for that limited experience in a corner of the courtroom, there's another long line outside. Americans clearly would like to know more about their Supreme Court. Today, most Supreme Courts in the states, two-thirds to be exact, allow television coverage, some of them for more than a decade now. Their experience is uniformly positive. No state court that is open to television has ever reversed that policy, and judges feel the enhanced public awareness and understanding of the court is all to the good. Furthermore, no court has found that the cameras undermine the procedure or the dignity of the court or induce the justices and the lawyers to histrionics. Some federal appellate courts have also had a positive experience with television coverage, at least on a limited basis. Still, our US Supreme Court, which usually prides itself on examining the facts and the evidence, refuses to consider these favorable examples and refuses to follow suit. The justices, or at least a majority of them, worry that television somehow will affect the dignity of their proceedings. But the cameras in the state courts are nearly invisible, small, usually built into the walls or the architectural nooks and crannies of the courtrooms, remotely controlled from studios elsewhere, noiseless and inconspicuous. They need only the available ambient light to obtain good pictures, like your cell phone. Why admit cameras? Because even in this internet age, most Americans still get most of their news from television. But the TV networks, without pictures to present, give almost no coverage to oral arguments and inadequate coverage, sometimes none at all, to many important decisions. That reluctance would vanish if this court permitted cameras. The resulting newscast would vastly enhance public understanding of the court and its important work. So the court remains obdurate, behind the times in communicating with the public, just at all, as it always has been. In this respect, it's a half century behind. Why? Who knows what the justices are really thinking. Chief Justice William Rehnquist once told a reporter that there was a difference between the justices' work and the reporters' work. Rehnquist said, we don't need you. Even if that were true, and it's not, it wouldn't justify the justices' implicit belief that the court is theirs, that only they can decide how much the public is entitled to know. Folks, it's not their Supreme Court, it's ours. To be sure, the press for its part could do better too, especially on those big decisions with broad public impact, for instance, school prayer, abortion, affirmative action, reverse discrimination, the hot button issues of the day. In covering these cases, there's a slippery tendency for newspapers, and especially for television, a tendency to provide only cursory coverage of the decision itself, who won, who lost, with little or no explanation of the court's legal reasoning. Instead, the media often emphasize reactions, the reactions of politicians, interest groups, and just ordinary citizens. 
It's much easier for a reporter to stick a microphone under a politician's nose, usually a politician whose views are already well known, and ask him, how do you feel about the court's decision? Much easier than taking the time to read through the court's opinion, often scores of pages of dense legalities, and ferret out the court's reasoning, its weighing of the law, the precedents, the arguments, and then writing about that decision carefully and precisely, but under deadline pressure. Most papers, with a few notable exceptions like the New York Times and the Washington Post, devote too little manpower and space, especially front page space, to Supreme Court arguments and decisions. And sometimes the copy readers or the page designers back in the newsroom, without checking with the reporter at the court, misconstrue even a good, accurate story and characterize it incorrectly in the headline. A common mistake, especially on television, even more than in the newspapers, is to report that the Supreme Court upheld a lower court decision, when in fact it merely declined to review that decision. That refusal is sometimes described correctly as declining to grant a petition for certiorari, or cert. It means the lower court decision is left standing. In other words, that decision remains valid, but it's not affirmed or upheld. In fact, a reporter shouldn't even say, as some do, that the court ruled on the case, because it didn't. The court simply declined to review or to consider the case. There's a big difference. One action is a decision of the court, a ruling, while the other is not. That non-decision means the court leaves open the possibility that it may sometime in the future take up the issue when another perhaps more appropriate or, or more urgent case is presented to it. Now, as you can sense, mistakes like this, whether made by reporters or editors, reflect a lack of knowledge on the part of the journalists, a lack of knowledge of how the court works, a lack of knowledge of the law, if you will. I covered the court before I went to law school, so I can testify from personal experience that a reporter trained in the law is better equipped to cover the, the court than a reporter who isn't trained. The New York Times, whose coverage over many years has been the best there is, always assigns a reporter with legal training to cover the court. That policy stemmed from the top, the court itself. In the early 1950s, Justice Felix Frankfurter asked the Times publisher, would you send a reporter to Yankee Stadium who knew nothing about baseball? Well then, why do you send reporters to the Supreme Court who know nothing about the law? Soon thereafter, the Times recruited a very capable young reporter from another paper. He had already won a Pulitzer Prize. He sent him to Harvard Law School for a year and then assigned him to the court. His name was Anthony Lewis, a name you longtime newspaper readers will remember. He did a su superb job at the court, winning another Pulitzer Prize, and the Times has insisted on at least that much legal training ever since. In fact, most of its reporters have been lawyers, Adam Liptak at present, for instance, with the notable exception of Linda Greenhouse, who covered the court with distinction for 26 years, also winning a Pulitzer Prize there after being dispatched to Yale Law School for just a year. Now, since I finished writing this book, I've been con concerned about what I consider to be another shortcoming in press coverage of the court. To me, good newspapers have a conscience. Large or small, most papers take pride in standing up for the average citizen, the little guy. That means watching out for him when he's up against powerful interests, whether they be businesses or criminals or the government. Our federal and state constitutions guarantee individual rights and freedoms, but they're not always self-executing. And whenever government encroaches on those individual rights, in my view, the newspapers should be alert to defend them. That's what our founding fathers said and the Supreme Court has often confirmed it. The press is free because its highest responsibility is to protect the people from the government, to make sure that government gives the little guy a fair shake, always. Yes, newspapers have a conscience. To me, they're the conscience of our country, standing up for what's right, what's fair. So I believe newspapers should give special attention to court cases that question individual rights, from the trial courts to the Supreme Court. The papers especially should point out such cases when they rise to the Supreme Court for review. They should cover the oral arguments, to cover the decisions, and when individual rights are impaired, they should squawk. Now these days, individual rights aren't doing particularly well at the Supreme Court. One of the court's most egregious recent rulings against individual rights came in the case of John Thompson, who spent a decade on death row for a murder he didn't commit. When DNA evidence finally freed him, Thompson sued the New Orleans prosecutor for damages. 
The prosecutor, by his own admission, had failed to turn over to Thompson, in stark violation of a Supreme Court rule, had failed to turn over before trial any evidence he encountered that would help the defendant. In Thompson's case, the prosecutor had deliberately concealed the results of a blood test, a blood type test before DNA, that proved conclusively that Thompson could not have been the murderer. Wrong blood type. Accordingly, a Louisiana jury awarded Thompson $14 million. But the Supreme Court threw out that judgment, denying Thompson's right to sue. The court said the prosecutor made just a single mistake, and that didn't justify a big judgment against him. But in fact, it wasn't just a lone mistake, as dissenting opinions forcefully pointed out. The trial testimony showed that there was a pattern of this kind of serious misbehavior in the prosecutor's office, and that he had not instructed his staff to turn over evidence to the defense, despite that very clear requirement of the US Supreme Court. So John Thompson got nothing. As I said, it was a shocking decision. The Times called it a glaring injustice. The Atlantic and Slate also spoke out against the decision. But most newspapers let it pass. How could they? There should have been a journalistic chorus of outrage. And this wasn't an isolated incident. The, the current Supreme Court has ruled against individual rights in a number of other cases. Just a couple of other examples. This spring, the court threw out a class action lawsuit brought on behalf of customers of AT&T Mobility, the cell phone service provider. The court upheld a small print arbitration clause in an AT&T customer service contract, a clause requiring the customer to waive the right to take part in a class action suit against the company. The New York Times called the decision a devastating blow to consumer rights, but most newspapers, again, were silent. In another case, the court trimmed the protection afforded by its longstanding Miranda rule, which requires the police to advise a suspect in custody of his right to remain silent. A 13-year-old suspected of two home break-ins in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, was interrogated at school in a closed room by a uniformed police officer and a police investigator. No Miranda warning was given. The youngster confessed and was found guilty. The Supreme Court sent the case back for reconsideration, but ruled that the boy's age could properly be considered in determining whether a Miranda warning was even required. In a cogent dissent, Justice Samuel Alito declared that the proper way to consider age should be to rigorously apply the constitutional rule against coercion to ensure that the rights of minors are protected. There is no need, Alito stated, to run Miranda off the rails. The press reaction was quite sparse, and it struck me as curious. Both the Times and the Washington Post, generally staunch supporters of individual rights, endorsed that ruling. The Post deemed it a modest but important step to ensure that minors are not intimidated or improperly manipulated into incriminating themselves. So how does a failure to warn accomplish that? The Times editorialized, also unconvincingly, that police will find that considering a suspect's age in delivering Miranda warnings is a prudent safeguard for that individual's rights and also for their work, meaning the work of the police. So no warning is not only legally OK, it actually protects the individual's rights and at the same time helps the police? How so? Now confronting the court in its new term are a boatload of challenges to individual rights. Questions such as these. Can the police use a secret GPS device attached to a suspect's car to track his movements without a warrant? Can they lawfully strip search a person accused of a traffic violation? Does a teacher fired because of physical problems lose her right to sue under the Americans with Disabilities Act just because she was working in a religious school rather than a public school? Do Medicaid recipients, in California in this instance, have a right to sue the state in the face of cutbacks they deem a violation of the federal Medicaid law? Must the police give a Miranda warning to a prison inmate being questioned about other crimes? May a state, yes, it's Arizona, stop, question, and arrest immigrants deemed illegal? Tough questions indeed, all testing individual rights against the power of the state. As the Los Angeles Times recently editorialized, vindicating individual rights isn't the only responsibility of the Supreme Court, but it's the most important. This term will test the court's commitment to that mission.
true. And it will also test the commitment of America's newspapers. May they rise to the occasion. Thank you for listening.